which is trusses. We just finished non-concurrent forces, so we now have uh, three um, ways or three things that need to be checked whenever we're um, checking for equilibrium for um, <clears throat> some object. So we got we've got to check the rotation, the movement in the x and movement in the y. But we're not talking movement and rotation. We're talking force here. So the moment is the measurement we use for rotation, and it's uh, the same as torque. So the sum of all the moments should equal zero. The sum of all the forces in the x direction should equal zero. And the sum of all the forces in the y direction should equal zero. If all of that's true, then that thing must be in equilibrium, which means it's not accelerating. Uh, so if the thing's not moving, it's definitely not accelerating. So it's definitely true that all of those three things are true. And that happens just about all the time in engineering, particularly if something's not moving, then we know that those three things are true. Uh, of course, this tower uh, had a period of not being in equilibrium there. I think that's one of the towers that got covered in ice in Canada. It got too heavy for itself. <clears throat> now, uh, when, we, when it comes to doing trusses, there's two distinct methods for solving a truss. There's the method of joints, which is the one we're looking at today. The other method is called the method of sections, right? which is another way to solve it. And, and in a sense, the method of joints is like a concurrent force way of solving it. And the method of sections is like a non-concurrent force way of solving it. So, uh, with the method of joints, <clears throat> we basically start on one side of the truss and work our way across to the other side. So um, I'm just going to do a quick overview and then we'll work through an actual problem to see how it works. So <clears throat> these um, these really are best uh, learned just by um, practicing them. But here we have a truss with uh, a bunch of forces on it. <clears throat> and you can see that um, the forces at the beginning have already been worked out for so our um, reaction forces at A and D have already been solved 20 and 10. So if that hasn't been solved you'll have an extra job to do and that is to find the reactions that's that was the task that we did in the previous chapter non-concurrent forces so you may have an extra step at the beginning which is find your reaction forces first. So once we've found the reaction forces then we're ready to start on the truss itself. Now we have seen things like this before, but we didn't solve the inside of the truss. We weren't trying to solve how much force is in these members inside the truss, uh, and which is what we're trying to do today. And so in other words, if the reactions aren't done, you have to do them. We're going through the process here of solving reactions and finding um, that, that the other side is 10, and then we add up all the verticals, the other one must be 20 because it equals 30 altogether. All right, so there's our reaction force. <coughs> now, <coughs> when we're doing the method joints, it's called method joints because um, <coughs> we're doing a free body diagram of each joint. In other words, we're going to be solve, solving each one as a concurrent. Because a joint is a non-concurrent, because all, all the members are attached to one joint. So if you imagine if you saw a truss, you know, like the ones that we just saw, you've got members like this, they're all coming together. Imagine if that was a truss, you need a bit of imagination. <clears throat> when, you're, when you're looking at a point like this one here, you can see that the... Um, Let's get rid of that extra bit there. You can see that all of those members are coming together in one spot. So, in other words, it's concurrent. So every time you're looking at a joint, like we have a joint down here as well, at this joint, everything's concurrent. You also have a force uh, pushing up here, of course. So there's three connections here at this one. Everything at every joint I can make a big dot there, is concurrent. We're solving each one of these as a concurrent force question. But there's a catch. The catch is we can only solve concurrent force questions if we have how many unknowns are we allowed? 
Okay, if you're trying to solve concurrent force, only solve if there is a maximum. Two unknowns. Now, two unknowns, that could mean you have unknown. plus another unknown magnitude that's the most likely one in the case of the truss because you usually know the directions of the truss because you know all the geometries we know all about angles in here <coughs> so two unknown magnitudes that's the most likely or we might have an unknown magnitude plus an unknown angle well, that's another way of saying an unknown force because those two which makes a force. And the third possibility is that there's two angles that you don't know. That's pretty rare. It's almost never going to happen in a truss because a truss most of the time has geometry that we already know. So from our perspective, when we're dealing with trusses, nearly every time we do a truss, <coughs> we'll have a... Um, We'll have this one. Oh. Two unknown magnitudes. <clears throat> this is the trust situation most often. Right, so we have a look at all these joints in the truss and we're looking for one that has a maximum of two unknowns. Right, so let's just have a look quickly. If I was to put some um, numbers in here we probably know our magnitude here what's our, our reaction force we've already found that and we'll have our reaction force here we'll just do everything vertical keep it simple there's another known there and let's say there was a downwards force in that one maybe downwards force in that one and we know all of these we know it they've already been calculated or told to us now, as I go through the truss, I'm going to see how many unknowns have I got in each one of these. Now, in this point here, let's call this A. At point A, how many unknowns are there? Well, I don't know magnitude here, and I don't know magnitude here. So point A has two unknowns. How many are allowed? Two. That means I could actually solve the concurrent force question at point A. Yes, I could. What about this one? We already know there's one missing there. This is all. We see we don't know any of these forces in any of these members. So they are all unknowns. So how many have we got here? Three. Can't do that one. This one's also got three. This one's, oh, well, this one's pretty busy. This one's got four unknowns. That's way out of possibility and once again this one is another two so we could start on the left hand side or the right hand side to solve um, this truss but we definitely can't do the other one. however as soon as we've solved one let's say we did solve a first once we've solved a we now know these two magnitudes so this one has gone down from three unknowns now it's two unknowns so that's two we can then solve this one and that's how we work through the truss. All right, so the key uh, thing about when you're doing concurrent is you, you have a maximum of two unknowns. Why is it two unknowns? Because this is concurrent forces, and concurrent forces has two equations. The sum of all the forces in the x direction must equal zero, and the sum of all the forces in the y direction must equal zero. Surprise, surprise, we knew that already. 
Don't forget that's exactly the same as a force polygon, which is one of these things. So if I add up forces, get myself back to the start point, like that, and that's a force polygon. A force polygon is the same thing, force polygon, is this, same thing. Because sum of all the force in the x and sum of all the force in the y takes you back to zero. So when you're doing a force polygon, you're saying, when I add up all the forces, I'll get zero. Well, when you add up all the x's, add up all the y's, you get zero. It's the same thing. So that's why you can have two unknowns. <clears throat> All right, we're going to work through uh, this problem and see. Uh, we say we solved our reaction. So here we go with our first, our first joint. So we've to, just like I uh, mentioned uh, just then in that sketch, it turns out that we're, we're going to probably start on one of the ends because there's only two unknowns. Uh, there's an unknown force in AF, member AF, and member AB. Or we could have also started at joint D because it also has two unknowns. But these other ones have got more than two. We can't start with any of those. So we decided to start on A for no particular reason other than it's on the left hand side. <coughs> I'm going to work across to the right hand side. So solving for joint A, I have three forces 120 vertical up, <coughs> something horizontal, something 60 degrees. So here I go to draw that. I do one force, this is, my, this is my start point down here, so I do one force at 20, so the length of this one is 20, <clears throat> and then I've got something horizontal and something 60 degrees, so I draw these two lines, horizontal and 60 degrees, and that gets me back to zero. So of course, um, you can, that one's a quite a simple one, but we would normally have four okay, to do this job. Okay, we had something, I can do this off the top of my head, right. So I know I had 20 kilonewtons, so I could do 20,000, or I could do 20, no matter, let's do 20, angle 90. Okay. Okay. Here's my first force, I'll just put a circle at the bottom to remind me where I started. <clears throat> now there was something horizontal, so I'll do a horizontal line. There's something 60 degrees, so I've drawn myself a line at 60 degrees on this other one. So some length, we don't care, and angle 60. So, right. There's my triangle. I then fill up those two, and that one was wrong. Why is that wrong? Because the direction of that force is. 60 degrees. There's my angle 60. But should it be 60 degrees? If you think about it, if it's starting here, that one's going up, this one's going to the right, this one should be going down. But I've got it drawing, I've drew that as if it's going up, but it should be going down because every time you draw a force polygon, it should go in a loop. So now, why am I worried about this? Because this is actually going to be quite important when we're dealing with trusses. We've got, we have to be very careful about the direction of the force. You'll see that in a minute. So I want to get these right. That's going up, so that one should be 100, uh, that should be 90 degrees, yes it is. This one should be zero degrees because it's going to the right, yes it is. And this one should be 180 plus 60, that should be 240, but it's 60. Okay, so that little fellow is going the wrong way. Okay, he has a little command called reverse. And that line, is now 240. So just reverse the line. Uh, if you forget that, you could just delete it and redraw it around the other way. <coughs> but if you just type in the command box reverse while it's on, then when you click on it, it's gone back to 60. So it's drawn it back the other way. So I'll type reverse again, and now that line is 240. All right, that's good. So it goes up, 
to the right and then back down to zero. Okay, now why is that important? Well, if I know the direction of these forces, that's going to have a big uh, effect on uh, what's um, the, the way I draw the forces at that joint. So this is quite quite critical. Let's go back to that. Right here. Let's have a look. <clears throat> if it's going up, that's up there, yeah, right? Now watch this one. If A B is going to the right. Now this is the method of joints, right? So what's the body? The body is the joint. The body is the joint. That is the little dot at joint A. That's the body. So this is the force polygon for the body joint. This is saying, what does this member do to the joint? Because the body is the joint, so it's to the joint. To the joint is pulling to the right. So if I'm pulling the joint, then member AB must be in tension because it's pulling the joint. This one here, it's going down at the joint. So it's pushing the joint. So member AF must be in compression because it pushes this joint. Now, once I know this one's in tension, that one's in compression, it can only be in tension if it pulls this one and also pulls joint B. It has to pull both sides, otherwise it won't stay still. <coughs> the same for member AF. If it's pushing on one end, it has to push the other end, otherwise it can't be in compression. So that's how we know more information about the next joint, because we said we can only solve two, but this one has three, but now we can reflect that force pushing the opposite direction because it's compression, so it pushes both ends. So now I've only got two unknowns at F, so F is my next candidate joint because it's now down to two. That's it, that's the method of joints. You just keep repeating that process every time. So we'll go to the next step, which is joint F, obviously. Joint F has three members, but we've already solved one. It's 23.094 from the previous question, but in the opposite direction. This is 60 degrees instead of 240 down at A. So we draw our force polygon. We start off with our 23.094, so um, the circle's not supposed to be there. We'll be starting here. So it goes down 23.094 first. Oh, sorry, up. Oh, sorry, yeah, the, the circle's at the bottom. So it starts, so here's our circle, that's our start point. We go up 23.094 at 60 degrees, and then there's something horizontal, which is member FE, and something vertical, which is member FB. Now, of course, this is uh, quite a fluke, but it happens to be exactly the same triangle as the previous one, but opposite direction. So it's not exactly the same. <clears throat> so now the horizontal one is in compression, and the vertical one, so it's going down at the joint, so that's the joint is going down from the joint, that means it must be pulling, so this is in tension. So member FL, no, sorry, FB is in tension, member FE is in compression. <clears throat> All right, so that means we've solved joint F. So how many unknowns have we got? At E, we've still got three unknowns there, we can't do that one. What about joint B? Now there's only two unknowns at joint B. Even though it's a busy joint, we've resolved already two of them. And that's a force we know, which is 30, so it leaves us with two to go. So we can go now to joint B. <coughs> Solving at joint B, now it's not a triangle this time because there's uh, five forces altogether. We start with the ones that we know from the question. So there's our start point zero. We do 30 down. We have this force A in AB, which is 11.547. To the left this time, not to the right, because on the other side of that member, 11.5 <coughs> to the left. Then this one, which was pulling down on F, is now pulling up on B, because it's in tension. Tension pulls both sides. So we get 20 up. And then we have something at 60, something at zero. So you just draw a 60 line and a zero line and trim it. Trim that polygon up and we get numbers 11.547 and 5.77. So there's the answer there. Now notice there's a fair bit of duplication of numbers. We're seeing that 11.547 floating around. So uh, the reason this duplication is because the truss is very geometric, everything's 60 degrees. 
and there hasn't there isn't many forces on it. There's only one force, so that will tend to happen. You will get um, repeats of numbers around the place. All right, so that's the method of joints. That's how it works. Um, we'll probably just do a worked problem after that. <coughs> uh, I will just go to the next um, part of this question because it's uh, fairly interesting. What's happening here at this joint C? Now, if I was to draw a force polygon for joint C, I'm going to have a bit of trouble. So before I go there, I'm going to do E. So E is now down to 2. If you look back here, we've got now we've got this extra one here from B. So we've now solved 2 out of the 4. We've got 2 to go. So we can solve joint E, which is a bit unusual. When we go to draw it up, we've got 60 degrees. So if we start here, I mean, we have a force going to the right, which is FE. So we get FE 11.547. Then we have this one pulling down at um, about 240 degrees. So that's this one here. And then we've got this one going back up at, uh, what's that, 120 degrees. And that's 60 degrees as well. Now, if these are the same length, and we have only 60 degrees, we've got no choice but to go straight back to zero. We have 11.5%. We just made an equilateral triangle. And guess what? We've not dealt with this member EC. In fact, you can't even get EC in there because it's an equilateral triangle. So the only answer for EC is that EC must be zero. Otherwise, you can't get back to zero. Now, is EC zero? Let's have a look at joint C. If you're trying to do a, a force polygon for joint C, you have horizontal forces and one vertical force. How can you make it go back to zero if you only have two horizontal forces and one vertical force? You can't. The two horizontals will cancel each other out fine. Well, then you can't get back to zero because you need two verticals to get back to zero. So when you have a situation where a member comes in and... Um, joins to two members that are on the same line, the two members on the same line must cancel each other out, and then this one must be zero, if there's no weight. If you had weight at joint C, then obviously you would, but if there's no weight at joint C, then um, this is a zero force member, which it is. Okay, so we've already solved this one. This one's easy to solve because that must equal that, so those... 5.77 goes across to there, which means we've solved our two here. We've already completed D. But just to be on the uh, safe side, let's double check D and see if we get the right answer. So we've got our numbers for this one, ED. It was pushing up, so therefore it's pushing down. It was pulling to the left, now it's pulling to the... Sorry, it was pulling to the right at C, now it's pulling to the left at D. Let's draw a force polygon for joint D. All right. What does the ground do to joint D? It pushes up. So what does uh, member ED do to joint D? It pushes down. So here we go, starting here. We push down. And here it's pulling 5.77. And here pushing up by 10. When we draw that up, it does make zero. So those numbers are correct. So that's one of the nice things about the method of joints. When you get to the end, you can double check yourself because it should match this uh, 10 at the end. You could have drawn those two forces and then measured our last force, it was 10, turns out to be correct. Method of joints, it's uh, a little bit slow because you go from one end to the other and you're working one joint at a time, but it solves every part of the truss, you know everything about every member, and um, you don't do anything more than a force polygon for each joint. <laughs> There's just one other thing I want to mention. Remember, this is called the method of joints, right? So the bodies are joints. So every force that you see on this truss, all these red forces, they're all joint-based. So that's the force on the joint A. Those are the forces on the joint B. So when you look at the member, this member is in tension. It doesn't look like it's in tension because the two arrows are going towards each other. So it can be confusing if you think from a member point of view that the tension has forces going inwards and the compression has forces going outwards, that's because you've got the wrong body. So if the 
forces were drawn in terms of the members, they would all be opposite. We would have to switch every single one the opposite way around. But we're not thinking in terms of the members, we're thinking in terms of the joints. So that's why the forces don't seem to match tension because the forces coming together is a member in tension. That's because the joints are pushing, are being pulled by the member. So um, keep in mind that all forces drawn on that truss diagram are with respect to the joint, not the member.